We begin with the controversy surrounding a failed contract awarded by the Ogun State government to a Chinese firm, which has once again cast a rather negative spotlight on Nigeria. At this time, Professor of Political Economy Pat Utomi has alleged that the former governor of Ogun State, Ibikunle Amosun, violated a contract he entered with his government. Utomi made the statement in response to Amosun's admission that he had cancelled an agreement with Zongshan Funcheng Industrial Investment Company Limited, a Chinese company. He said that the company had fake documents and called them imposters. A court in France later ruled in favor of the company and ordered the seizure of three Nigerian presidential jets. In a tweet on his ex handle on Sunday, Utomi claimed that, like the Chinese company, he also faced a similar fate. Now, according to Utomi, it was Governor Mosun's violation of contract terms signed by his predecessor that brought the shame of the seizure of debts from the presidential fleet. Professor Utomi alleged that the decision of Amosun to cancel contracts by his predecessor led to a prominent Ogun State citizen committing suicide. Meanwhile, former Governor of Ogun State, Senator Bikunle Amosun, has described the renowned professor of political economy, Pat Utomi, as an enemy of the state. Amosun stated this while responding to a post on X where Utomi alleged that Amosun did not honor an agreement preceding his administration. Now, the former governor of Ogun State also hinted that the State House of Assembly had already declared Utomi persona non grata. Now, joining us on the news to discuss more on this is Nigerian economist Professor Pat Utomi. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us at this time. Thank you so very much. All right, so first you. of all, what came to your mind when you heard about the incident with Zongchen Fucheng Industrial Investment Company Limited and the seized Nigerian assets? Well, first of all, I heard of the seizure of Nigerian aircraft, and I actually tweeted on it about two or three days ago, not knowing the source of why, you know, the reason for the seizure. Yesterday night, I was going through my social media and saw a news clip from one of the TV stations in which it was brought up that it was as a result of uh, contracts failure in Ogun State. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm familiar with that territory. And then I, I, I tweeted about 4 a.m. my time sometime uh, this morning in, um, in Nigeria um, that I had a similar experience. Um, I have been working on developing the agriculture value chains in Nigeria for quite some time, arguing that this is the future most regular businessmen will not do it because it's long term mm. and all of that. Mm. So I decided to go into it from two ends of the value chain. The distribution to create demand and the supply by creating what is called an integrated produce city, uh, which I'm actually executing at this time in uh, Edo State. The original intention was to execute it in Ogun State to then fuel the supply line. Um, we needed to create a master outlet in Lagos that would showcase what we're trying to do, where women can be coming back from work at 7, 8 p.m. and drive in an air-conditioned environment, buy all the food and stuff they need. And we thought a great location was the OPIC Plaza in Lagos. We um, approached OPIC and they said they, we could develop a portion of the estate uh, in a BOT, we would develop it, we would pay them a lease for 15 years, and uh, at the end of the lease, the property will revert to Ogun State. So they had to get involved in the design and all of that. We went along, we signed an agreement with them. This happened under the watch of um, 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 Governor Binga Daniel. Um, when the uh, Ogun State governorship turned hands and Amosun came on, uh, he put a stop, I believe, on just about everything that was approved by his predecessor. And when I was told that, I then tried to reach out to say, why are we being stopped from developing this facility? 
And he said to me, no, your name is not on the list. I said, but they said everybody developing anything in OPIC Plaza should stop. He said, really? I, don't, I didn't see your name. Why don't you come to Abekuta? And I drove to Abekuta with my partner in the, pro in the project. We came to him. He sent for the people in charge. The permanent secretary was supposed to be away in the UK to the graduation of his child. And so Mrs. Yewande Amuson and one of her colleagues came forward. And he said to them, Prof says that uh, his project, that he has a project in that place and that is part of the thing stopped. But I didn't see his name. So they said, no, his own is a simple, very straightforward deal. So we didn't bother to put it there. He said, ah, you people are trying to protect Prof because he's Prof. They said, no. So he jokingly said, okay, bring everything together, put his own in it. And, um, you know, when the pump set comes out, it comes back in two weeks, everything will be sorted. And I thought it was over. But that started a four-year rigmarole. Mm. Uh, at the point, I was really frustrated. Our South African partners, in whom or with whom we had invested tens of millions of na na naira, trying to develop the supply chain for this store across the country, farmers in Yola, all kinds of places that we have secured agreements with, and all of that. Everybody was frustrated. Um, so one day he said I should come back to Abekuta so that we can sort this matter out. And then he suggested that I should, um, you know, because of issues, I should, uh, that they will pay me back my money. I said, but I don't want the money. I just want to execute this project. It's only 15 years, you, uh, uh, people will take back the property. I said, uh, you know, one thing or the other. Then uh, he said, look, he was rushing to Abuja that uh, we should drive back to Lagos together and talk about it. Then my partner, my everybody else went. I drove with him in his car. He was driving. He asked his uh, ADC and driver to go to another car. And we talked about this thing for all the way from Abekuta to Lagos. We stopped in his house in Lagos. He said, look, uh, OP cannot give more than 100 million naira back to you uh, because, you know, the way government is structured. So just write a letter asking for 100 million. When you get it, the next day, write another letter uh, saying it is still left. I knew it was, it sounded strange, but I said, well, <laughs> I know Nigeria. If I go to court, we may stay there for 25 years, by which time I've died or whatever, and he's gone on and I would have lost everything. But at least let me hold on to this 100 uh, million. I hope that uh, uh, what he has said is uh, what he will do. Mm. Got the 100 million check in two tranches of 50, 50 million. And then I wrote him to say, okay, the balance has discussed. And that was the, where the story continued till he ended his term as governor. And I then um, went to the new governor, who incidentally wanted me very much to be the keynote speaker for his inauguration lecture. I then said to him, look, I have this matter that is pending here. Can you fix it? And after a while, they, after one year, two years, he said to me, look, the way that I most manage, manage this in, the, the case is closed, that he has paid you. I said, what? Wow. Anyway, today I then get this statement that I'm mostly supposed to have made, which is um, incredible for an accountant uh, uh, to be uh, able to say things like that. Uh, all right. So before you that, uh, Professor, you're saying that you didn't get the balance of your uh, money. That's the remaining 100 million naira you're expecting. 200 million. I was expecting more. Oh, okay. All right. Now, I, got, you're... I got 100 million. Okay. Now, but you I also money i wanted to do my pro my project i didn't ask for money this was the governor insisting or suggesting that best for me is to take that the money all right uh professor you also mentioned uh you know uh, other victims uh, that were in similar circumstances uh, you even said one of them committed suicide can you tell us uh, more about if, this if, person if you, notice, if you notice i use the word alleged Alleged. So All right, can I, you tell? I, I, yeah, alleged. What, what, what more can you tell us about papers. that? I don't know. I, I, I read in the papers at that time that one businessman from Ogu committed suicide on account of the, those kinds of issues. Uh, that's what, just what I read in newspapers. So that's why I said alleged. Oh, okay, uh, Professor, do you know, do you think that, you know, Governor Mosun actually knows the impact of, uh, you know, uh, his actions? 
Well, you know, uh, in, in, in his comeback, he said that I was one of those entitlement people wanting government to give me. I don't do business with government. Go and check. I have never done business with government except just because I hate the business of bribes. I don't do business with government. Only when it's going to land where you have no choice. Government is the only one who has the authority to issue certificates of occupancy. Check my business career. Nothing with government. So uh, for him to say entitlement and government is very funny because the irony there is that when uh, Lagos State uh, came back to democracy, the governor then, who as you know is in Abuja now, had me helping out. I used to organize quarterly retreats for the government. I charged Lagos State government nothing. In fact, I can tell you one particular three-week stretch. I did a retreat for a well-known bank, charged them 20 something million naira, did for Nimasa, charged them 20 something million naira, did for Lagos State government, charged them zero. The man in charge is Yemi Kadoso, who is Governor of Central Bank. He can corroborate that any time. So to wake up and I'm also decides that I'm entitlement trying to use influence, it's, it's, it's so preposterous. I don't even know where to start to look at the issue. But it, show, it shows the character of our politicians and what they try to invent. It says, for example, that um, Ogun State government had declared, um, House had declared me personal non grata on account of what? I had had no transaction of, of any type ever with Ogun State government except a lecture I gave free of charge to the cabinet of Ogun State at a retreat about 20 something years ago. And the inaugural lecture, which happened years after, of the incumbent governor. I've had nothing to do with Ogun State in any shape, form, or so how could they have declared me personal non grata? I'm not a person who does business with government. But it shows you how they can say anything in their desperation. Uh, okay. It's really sad for the country. Okay, Prof, That's why now... investors are worried about Nigeria. Oh yes, you also did mention in your tweet, you know, that you met with Baba Konde and also President Tinubu you know, to resolve this situation. Yes. What did they do to help, you know, considering that you lost they, such a huge amount of money? And did you feel hurt? Yes, I did, of course. And they said they would do their best. They will try. Uh, I won't mention names now because this is personal. One of them said, mm, that I'm Muslim is well, it's too much, Joe. But they will try. Anyway. That's where we are. Okay. All right. So uh, tell us about how the revocation impacted your business and also investments in Nigeria, especially with your South African partner. And I'm talking about, you know, the financial and reputational consequences. In, in terms of reputation, costing reputation goes into billions, the extent of the loss. I had to reverse the strategy. Instead of starting from... Uh, upstream, and I went downstream, or the other way around, so to speak. And I began to try to develop the more expensive, the more problematic um, integrated produce city, where you're supposed to aggregate crop from farmers from, say, several states, and then create a commodities exchange. As a result of the commodities exchange, you will then supply these kinds of outlets. Mm -hmm. Um it would have been easier if we had taken off with this and begun to uh, 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 make income from this and then invested into the uh, the supply chain. But they prevented us from doing that, prostrated our foreign partners, and they left. So the cost to me, literally, is billions of naira. Okay. Uh, now, just before we let you go, Prof, you mentioned karma in relation to your experience. Now, can you help me understand what you mean by that and how it played out in the situation uh, with uh, the Zongchen Fungchen company? Well, you know, the law of karma, it comes back to haunt you. It has finally come back to haunt him, Amosu. He is now going to be remembered as the man who brought Nigeria this shame because of his conduct. I had nothing to do with that transaction with the Chinese. I don't know about any of the details, but clearly from my experience, and it was generally a broad sense for what he did with many other things approved by his predecessor. We need to stop Nigerian governors from doing this. 
I, I mentioned that in a book I've just written, uh, uh, I I wrote a case on a similar thing in Enugu, so it's not just about him, and that this also affected South African partners who left after millions of dollars had been invested in an estate development in Enugu. Uh, we must stop this. Our country cannot make progress if we continue like this. All right, uh, 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 Professor, just one more question. What do you think the Nigerian government or the Nigerian elite should be doing to care for our reputation as a nation? It is so fundamental to make progress. You know, my mantra is values shape human progress. Until we have a value-based system where integrity matters so much, the work ethic matters, merit matters, Look, we can talk about progress till eternity. It will not happen. The Nigerian elite must imbibe a new value system. So know that if people don't trust you, that you will st stand by your word, they will not do business with you. Commerce is about trust. And if you, for personal reasons or whatever reasons, will violate contracts all over the place, they will just go to somewhere where they may not have the room to make as much return as Nigeria, but their, their return is assured. And Nigeria will stay underdeveloped. That is the simple logic of this. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Utomi, for your time and also for sharing your experience with us. It was a great pleasure. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Now, the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project has urged the Senate President, Godwin Lakbabio, and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tajuddin Abbas, to disclose the exact amount of monthly running costs allotted to members of the National Assembly. Sarah requested the spending details of any of such running costs as well. This information was made known in a statement dated August 17, 2024, signed by Deputy Director of Sarah. The group's demand is coming on the heels of the recent controversy surrounding the salary of senators. A former senator representing Kaduna Central, Senator Shehu Sani, had stated that senators receive over 13 million naira monthly, but the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission faulted his claim. The streets of Maiduguri, the Brno state capital, is home to many children who have fled due to the insurgency or brought in from other parts of Nigeria. Now, these children face an uncertain future as they struggle to survive and navigate life outside the safety of their homes. New Central's Umari Kirawa, who interacted with the street children, reports on their lifestyle and some of the untold stories of the future generation. A normal peaceful day for everyone struggling to survive in Nigeria's northeast state of Borno. The echoes of the years of conflict is gradually fading away in towns and villages. According to the state government, from 2 million, Borno state now battles with about 800,000 out of school children who roam the streets for survival. <laughs> The story of Ba Usman is different as he is pursuing Islamic studies at a Sangaya with keen interest and an ambition to become a pilot. For many, there is no difference between out of school, abundant or street children and the Almajri who strive to gain Islamic knowledge. Street children are those that were abandoned by their parents. But al are those that are already registered to various schools and institutions. Those children that he interacted with, amongst them are up to 87,000 that were registered by the state government. But this 87,000 that were registered by government under the custody of government is not even up to 5% of these children. However, the narrative is that both the abundant, out of school, and al Majri all beg for food on the streets to survive. First, if the government is serious, they could have a restored constitutional mandate for the traditional institutions. 
the traditional institution is very much connected with the community, with the society. The Nigerian state is completely disconnected from the community. The Nigerian government is not sensitive to the sensibilities of the community. They are absent. The government may have attempted to restore some sorts of fin financial autonomy to the local government, but this, start at the, this stopped at the political level. The councillor and their chairman, which were not even known to the people of the community. The situation is there for these street children, who often lack access to basic necessities and are vulnerable to exploitation, like rape and harvest of organs, among others. Nande wuna ya ande okodu ya kamata cha gumna ji ande televizire ande ona la kaza ande akira la rosika ande okumunde interaction malombonde welu edi alambonde zo duk lomonde wa In the case of the almajiris while some are out on the street in the daytime and return to their parents home later in the day others are accommodated in boarding facilities where they sleep in their schools however feeding these almajiris remains one of the major challenges of the system, forcing the children to roam the streets begging. Let's now start forming uh, groups within communities that will be addressing maybe the educational needs of these children. Some will focus on maybe entrepreneurship. It is not mandatory for everybody to marry. There are criteria. Apart from maturity, are you fit mentally, physically, and morally, in addition to financial capacity to take care of the needs of the one that you will bring under your care. As part of the measures to address this menace, the Borno State has built mega schools such as this to meet to the growing number of out-of-school children. But it seems to be inadequate. What matters is our population, and then what matters is we don't know who is working in the state. And unless something is being done, we shall not get rid of this problem. The government says it is taking steps to monitor and control the influx of unaccompanied children to the state. However, the challenge remains. <laughs> In this late night hours, I met one of my friends, Abu Bakar Adam, who um, usually sleeps here, and um, he will tell us more about uh, the experience here. As you can see, mosquitoes are everywhere, and this is where these children are, 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 are sleeping. <laughs> The point here is it is not about complaining or pointing accusing fingers but most importantly an action is needed to address the issue of street children in Maiduguri for News Central Umaru Kirawa Thank you Umaru for that report now joining us on the news to discuss this is Professor Abdul Karim Ishaq from the Department of Continuing Education and Extension Services Unimade Burno State Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining us at this time. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. All right. First of all, uh, how do you think that the government and NGOs can actually work together to address the root causes of this crisis and uh, also provide sustainable solutions for these vulnerable children who are on the streets all day? Uh, thank you very much. To begin with, if you can focus your mind a little bit back to the emergence of this insurgency in Borno State, one will vividly discover that what brought about all this issue of uh, street children and out-of-school children is specifically as an aftermath of the insurgency. And you know, during that particular period of insurgency, a lot of people lost their parents and uh, they don't even know where they are. And some of the close relations that could at least take care of them might have also been killed during the, the insurgency period. But not only that, one discovered that recovering from this particular insurgency became so important 
to the heart of the state government. And the state government haven't seen these particular destructions and uh, issues that has to even affect the, the psychic of these particular uh, children. The state government decided to come up with a lot of policies and strategies that could be adopted in order for these particular children to also be treated equally like any other child. But some of the efforts of the government in this particular aspect were the reconstruction of the schools that were destroyed during this particular insurgency. And apart from that, to also set up uh, uh, Asangera Arabic and Azadaya Education Board so that to see that well, how can these particular children be brought back to the uh, uh, classrooms? Mm. And, and uh, you know, there are a lot of issues that uh, succeeded in making these particular children to be in the streets. Notably among these is the economic situation of those that even have the parents for them to be able to take care of their own children. Yeah. So some of them, uh, you know, being allowed to go out and seek like kind of uh, source of livelihood, how they can get food to eat and do small menial jobs to be able to get little things that it, they can bring back home. But having said that, there are ways that we'll be able to do in order for us to take care of this particular situation. Notable among these could be the issue of uh, community engagements. Engage the community, get the uh, clarity, the, the, the faith-based organization to come up together with the government and then to see how and uh, ways and avenues through which we could adopt okay, now, in now, order for us to com completely arrest this particular issue of uh, street children. And apart from that, even presently, there is a huge uh, amount of collaboration between the state government and then some of the non-governmental organizations in terms of uh, provision of palliatives and then uh, 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 maintaining the schools you know, uh, giving the students school uniforms and well, books, that, just that, to encourage them yeah, to, that's, to that's be brought actually, back to school. That's uh, good to note, uh, Professor. Uh, now, you did talk about some of the challenges, you know, uh, that these kids are facing, and you did say that uh, some of the parents don't even have what it takes to be able to take care of their children or even send them to school. So uh, can you tell us what are the biggest obstacles, you know, to getting out of school or even street children, getting street children off the streets and into education or vocational training programs? What are the biggest obstacles or challenges that you face? Well, I think largely you discover that uh, this issue of uh, 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 financial uh, uh, muzzle by the parents. And apart from that, you discover that if there is a good amount of uh, advocacy and creation of awareness, and trying to let the parents and even the children understand that it is more important for them to take a little bit longer time in school and then get out in a bigger way than for them to stay in the streets and then get a little uh, uh, chicken feed from what they are being uh, asked to do and then being paid. So advocacy and creation of awareness is very, very important in this regard. And then also the issue of community engagement. If communities, the community gatekeepers and the community leaders are being taken as part of this particular process, you, you see they are more and more, more closer to the community and they understand the mindset of the community. So definitely something will come up and then the children that are roaming the streets will now be reduced to a minimal level and gradually at the end of the day, it's going to be over. And then also from the part of the government, mm. there is also need for the government to set up um, a more important and then robust strategy that will be able to, at least to some extent, find a way to create source of uh, uh, income to these particular parents so that at least with little financial muscle, they will be able to feed themselves and take care of their uh, uh, catering arrangement, and then the children will not be uh, uh, roaming the street. 
Right. But despite that, yes, go ahead. All right, Professor. But what about uh, community leaders, uh, religious organizations, and also uh, local businesses? What roles can they play in supporting uh, the efforts uh, of the government and, you know, of these NGOs to address this growing crisis of out-of-school children or even, uh, you know, street children in the region? Yeah, you see, to be very frank with you, government cannot do it all alone. Because if you look at the financial muscle of the government, each and every time it is becoming, you know, a little bit smaller than ever been thought. And then the population too is every day growing to a level that if you say you're going to do it as a government, to some extent it is going to stretch the financial muscle of the government that will be used in terms of doing other uh, 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 amenities social amenities like, uh, you know, hospitals, taking care of the hospitals and then provision of maybe fertilizers and what have you. But the individuals within the communities, those that have, should come together and then see reason in trying to build the indigence of this particular state from this particular situation that are in and also through the help of, you know, maybe food staff and then uh, encouraging them with little financial uh, uh, startup fund okay. to start businesses. I think it will go a long way in trying to reduce to a minimal level this okay. issue of uh, street children and out of school children in the streets of uh, most of our states in northern Nigeria. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ishak, for speaking to us on this and also for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Away from that, stakeholders in Nigeria's federal capital have expressed diverse views on the recent approval of a 300% pay rise for judiciary officers in the country. Now, while some view the move as an effort to reduce corruption and combat inducements of judges, Others believe more alternate measures like the employment of more judges should be utilized to improve the nation's justice sector. New Central's Emmanuel Bagudu reports. With thousands of high-profile cases in Nigerian courts, the need for judicial officers to display and maintain a high level of integrity has never been more apt. While unproven rumors abound of many judges being compromised by Nigeria's political elite, there has been a nationwide call for judges to maintain a high standard of integrity and shun corruption. The move by Nigeria's Senate to increase the salaries of judicial officers by 300% is seen as a move to make judges foolproof against graft in the light of recent allegations against judges by the National Judicial Council. Having a 300% increase in salaries and emolument is a work on development. It could help those who want to be upright amongst them to live upright because they now have more resources to live a decent life. It's a very huge hurdle to cross when you have a legal case in Nigeria. Um, we know that we don't have enough judges, the court systems are inundated with the sheer volume of petitions um, and cases. So will these increases translate into a smoother operations for the judiciary? Go a long way in strengthening the judiciary to be able to perform adequately. So I think it is a commendable legislation. Citizens are supposed to be happy that the judiciary, the protector of the common man, you know, the, their, their welfare package has been improved. It, it is supposed to be something that was supposed to be, to be joyous to all of the populace. But it is, it is accepted now with mixed feelings. Some citizens believe that the 300% pay rise will contribute to bringing sanity to the nation's justice sector. The tendency the, or the temptation to be induced is directly linked to poor, poor remuneration. So when you have them being adequately remunerated now, it's a kind of um, a brick wall against such temptations. The judiciary, let's not forget, is an important component of democracy. And no matter how we look at it, it's an important component of democracy. But 
This is the time for the judiciary to fight for its own relevance. With citizens divided on the need to increase salaries of judicial workers, the conduct of judicial officers will now be judged more thoroughly. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. The news continues in North Africa, where the Central Bank of Libya said on Sunday it was suspending all operations after a bank official was abducted in the capital, Tripoli, in a statement posted on social media. Musab Msalem, head of information technology of the Central Bank, was kidnapped by an unidentified group from his house Sunday morning. The bank said it will not resume operations until Msalem is released adding that other executives were also threatened with abduction. Sunday's abduction came a week after the central bank's headquarters in Tripoli was laid siege to by armed men. Reports say they did so in an attempt to force the resignation of the bank's governor, Sadiq Al-Kabir. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has denied owing international oil traders $6.8 billion dollars. The company also refuted claims that it has not remitted funds into the Federation account since January. NNPC Chief Corporate Communications Officer Olufemi Shuneye responded to various allegations against the state-owned energy firm in a statement on Sunday. It was alleged that NNPCL owed some of its suppliers as the sole importer of petrol in Nigeria, though Shuneye acknowledged that such transactions are conducted on credit. He, however, did not specify the financial obligations that NNPCL is currently addressing. The Private Equity and Venture Capital Association of Nigeria, PEFCA, has stated that foreign investors are apprehensive about implementing the over $30 billion investment pledges in Nigeria over the instability in the country's foreign exchange market. The group stated this in its media review and strategic outlook for the country, which explored the private investment landscape and factors shaping trends in the sector. According to the association, issues of foreign currency repatriation have worsened the investment risk level in the country, using the FMCG sector as an example, stating that reduction in private sector consumption coupled with elevated inflation levels have eroded private sector investments. It added that the presence of key risks, especially challenges with getting foreign exchange out of the country, makes immediate investments appealing only to a specific group of people. Zambia's proposed minerals regulation law could deter investment and deliver a fatal blow to plans to raise annual copper output to 3 million tons, two mining bodies have said. Zambia's government has proposed a new Minerals Regulation Commission bill, which seeks to regulate and monitor the development and management of mineral resources in Africa's second biggest copper producer. But Zambia's Chamber of Mines, the main mining industry body, and the Association of Zambian Mineral Exploration Companies said in a joint statement some parts of the proposed law will drive up the perception of investment risk in Zambia. Ethiopian Airlines is said to make a significant mark on the regional aviation landscape with its ambitious plan to construct Africa's largest airport in Abu Sera. This mega project is a cornerstone of the airline's 15-year strategy to become a world-leading aviation powerhouse. As part of that overall strategy, the strategic location of Abu Sera offers the airline unparalleled potential for growth. It will allow Ethiopian Airlines to comfortably accommodate the International Air Transport Association's projects. IATA has projected a 200% increase in passenger traffic which will occur in the region over the next decade. The development of a large-scale airport operation in Abu Sera is a key component in Ethiopian Airlines' ambitious expansion strategy. And that's all on Business News. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon on Obanjo. The news continues after the break. Stay with us. And the world of sports. The Nigerian representatives in the CAF Champions League, Remo Stars and Enugu Rangers, earned narrow first leg wins. Join Favor Itwa for more updates. 
Nigeria's under-18 women team narrowly lost to Chile 22-23 on Sunday in their President's Cup Group A opening match at the ongoing 2024 International Handball Federation Championships in Chuzhou, China. After the conclusion of the preliminary stage, Nigeria qualified for the President Cup, having missed out on the main round. During this stage, Nigeria's under-18 team lost their first Group B match to Croatia 33-11 and fell to Montenegro 26-9, but managed to secure a win against Angola 29-21. This loss places Nigeria in second place, with Austria leading the group, while Chile and Angola occupy the third and fourth positions respectively. Nigeria will next face group leaders Austria, while Angola will take on Chile on Tuesday, August 20th. And out to football, Enugu Rangers began their CAF Champions League campaign with a 1-0 win over Comoros side U.S. Zilimaju at the Goswil Akbabi International Stadium, Uyo, to get first leg advantage. Frank Uwumiro opened the scoring for Rangers in the 22nd minute with a comfortable finish. The Flying Antelopes had opportunities to double the lead in the first half but were wasteful in front of goal. Coach Fidelis Ilechuku threw the trio of Oyekacho Kafo, Bashir Usman and Kazim Ogunleye into the game in search of more goals but were met with resolute defending from Zilimaju. Rangers will take the slim victory into the return leg on Friday at the same venue. It will be recalled the Comoros side chose Uyo as their home after CAF failed to approve their home ground. The Flying Antelopes will have an opportunity to play again on Friday in the same venue being the home team. Still talking the Champions League, Remo Stars end a 2-1 victory over Asfa of Morocco in the first leg of CAF Champions League first preliminary round in Ikene on Sunday. Unduka Jr. opened the scoring for Remo Stars in the 19th minute when he glanced home a Sadiq Ismaili free kick from the right. In the 34th minute, Remo Stars goalkeeper Obasa Adebi made a big stop of the opponent's fast break. The away side leveled four minutes after the break through Beya Joel. We need to keep our head up. We have to take our time out to finish now. We must not be tired of the winner. We must not be tired of the We are not weak. We are not weak. The Sky Blue Stars push movement forward in search of a winner. Log soon shined on them in the 68th minute when Sadiq Ismaili headed home a glorious cross from Unduka Jr. The Kenneth Bay side will take the narrow win to the return leg in Morocco and hope for a good result to progress to the next round. And to wrap up sports update, Ademola Lukman is not in the Atalanta squad for the Serie A opener at Lecce as reports emerge about the Europa League's hero possible move to Paris Saint-Germain. Nigerian forward Lukman became an Atalanta legend in May when his stunning hat-trick downed German champions Bayer Leverkusen and won the traditionally provincial club their first ever European trophy, a first major honour of any sort since 1963. However, the 26-year-old was not included in the squad announced on Sunday for Atalanta Strip South, where Gian Piero Gasperini's side will begin their league campaign on Monday evening. Internal media have widely reported that Lukman's representatives have told Atalanta of PSG's interest as the club go through an eventful summer transfer window. Interesting time ahead in the world of sport. That wraps it up on Sports Update and favor it were. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our top stories. We told you that former Ogun State Governor Amosun, Professor Pat Utomi, traded words over presidential debt seizure. We also told you that Terap has demanded transparency from National Assembly leaders. Finally, you heard that Libya has suspended all operations after kidnapping of staff. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV Channel 422, Thought On Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Dawson Usman.